Hello everybody, good morning and welcome to the Christocentric Meal, a daily reflection of your true identity in Christ Jesus. Abel Damina is my name and I'm excited to welcome everyone this morning to this great time of studying the word of his grace. I'd like you to invite a friend and a loved one. Let's do it together today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for great grace, mercy and Jesus. We have access into the deep things of God by the Holy Spirit. I pray for everyone connected to the broadcast today, the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light. Clarity comes to you by the word, veils fall off, and in the name of Jesus, you are built up, equipped, edified. Jesus is glorified. Thank you, Father, for answering prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we're looking at learn to forgive, part 11. Learn to forgive. The believer must deal with offenses. He must not abhor offenses in his heart. He must walk in love towards people. Practical things to do in dealing with offenses. Number one, always and never get carried away with the present and forget who you were. Never. Never get carried away. You must always remember who you are and who you were even before the offenses came. Very important. By this I mean, don't start feeling like I am a child of God as though you have always been. I am a man of faith and power as though you were born so. I am a man of God as though it was your family name. You were a sinner saved by mercy and grace. Peter puts it this way. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him, and has become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. That's the Amplified Translation. We all hold on to the thread of God's mercy. None of us can ever claim self-justification. We are only here by mercy. We offended God, and even now we still do. He took the blame. He loved us and still does. We need to constantly remind ourselves that we are sinners outside of God's mercy. This will put us in check when we feel aggrieved by others. Paul did this often. In 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, he says, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace, unmerited favor and blessing of our Lord actually flowed out super abundantly and beyond measure for me accompanied by faith and love that are to be realized in Christ Jesus. 15 says, The saying is sure and true and worthy of full and universal acceptance that Christ Jesus, the Messiah, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. That's the Amplified of that scripture. Never forget who you were. Never. When all is said and done, all of us, I mean all of us, will be hanging only, I repeat, only on the mercy of God in eternity. That's what we'll be hanging on. All our braggadocious before men, our church members, will have ended. All our solid and oftentimes arrogant boasts on new creation realities will have no effect. Only his mercy will be our hope and faith. Never forget it. Never, never forget that. If God were to revenge daily, humanity will need to be created again daily. No one will survive a day. No one. No, not one. Number two, pray for your offenders. Pray for your offenders. We have been taught to pray against. This is not from the word of God. There's no such place. When you are hot, get hot. When you are H-U-R-T, get H-O-T. When you are hot, get hot with praying for the offender. Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that cause you and do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. How is this done? Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Acts 760, Stephen, and falling on his knees, he cried out loudly, Lord, fix not this sin upon them. Lay it not to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep 
in death. That's the amplified translation. Both Christ Jesus and the man in him turned the focus on the Father in prayer. They refused to get personal about things done unto them. They saw the sin as falsely sin against God. Hence, they prayed, heaped coals of fire upon the heads of the offender, overcome evil with good. We must include praying daily for those who offend us. It must be a prayer point for God to heal, bless, and forgive them. They shouldn't fall down and die because they hurt us. We didn't or don't because we continually hurt God. People must be blessed when they hurt us. It is an opportunity for God's blessings when they offend us. Evil done deeds creates the way for good, darkness for light. Man's sins brought out the best of God, which is the love of God. When anyone offends you, it's only an avenue to bring out your best, which is the nature of God. That's an opportunity for you. See, when people offend you, don't respond to them, you know, the way you feel. Don't. Let what is truly in you be your response. See, when people insult you, it's not because you're a bad person. It's because that's what they have inside them. So that's an opportunity for you also to bring out the goodness and the love of God on your inside to overcome the evil done to you. When anyone offends you, it's only an avenue to bring out your best, which is the nature of God. Wherever and whenever you read this, stop and pause. Over those who sinned against you, wronged you, get on your knees and pray at least five minutes. Thank you, Father. Wow. Now say these words with me. I was a sinner saved by grace. I have not right to be unmerciful as I am a man saved only by mercy. I will never allow revenge. No offenses. I walk in the light. Praise the Lord. Father, I pray for everyone watching the broadcast who has been offended. And I pray for their offenders in the name of Jesus that they will experience the goodness of God so overwhelmingly that they begin to see that there's no need to be nasty, no need to be funny, and no need to be insulted. That the goodness of God will overcome all of their bad feelings and bad behavior. In the name of Jesus. And I pray for those offended that the healing word of God will bring healing to every part of your heart, every part of your thoughts and your mind. And in the name of Jesus, I decree that if through the offenses certain things went wrong around your life, that restoration takes effect right now. In the name of Jesus, I decree that this day the peace of God reigns in your heart and mind. Scripture tells us, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, that your people walk in the love, the light of your word, and have no occasion of stumbling. Today, your going out is blessed. Enjoy the goodness of God in the land of the living. Father, I give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Make sure you order for the Christocentric meal today. Hard copy, the announcer will tell you how to get that from our office. Digital copies from Amazon. Praise God. It's a joy to share with you the word of God every day. And my prayer is that you continue to abound in grace and abound in knowledge and be the best that God designed for you to be. Great grace is yours. Looking forward to share fellowship with you again tomorrow, same time. Invite people to hook up. And until then, enjoy the rest of your day. This is Abel Damina saying that the kingdom of God is in power. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. Brother Paul says to Timothy, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The word in Christ here relates to the Old Testament. The scriptures in Christ. In Christ in the Old Testament. The scriptures. Which is faith in Christ or faith in God's promise or faith in God's prophecies concerning Christ. That's what it means by in Christ in the scriptures. Faith in Christ which is salvation in the scriptures or faith in God's prophecies concerning Christ. 
faith in Christ opens up the Old Testament for you. To understand the Old Testament, it takes faith in Christ. Moses said in the Old Testament, A prophet like unto me shall God raise up unto you of your brethren. And he said to them, Him shall you hear. And he said, Any one of you that will not hear him shall be destroyed. So faith in Christ opens up the New Testament. It's faith in Christ that unravels the mystery of the Old Testament for us. Please pay attention. Jesus said in Luke 24, 25, he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Next verse. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That's instructive. To believe all that the prophets have spoken. Let's look at some things about Bible study. Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Next verse. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Next verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Pay attention to the word expounded unto them. Is the word daimenua. It means to interpret the things concerning himself. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Brother Paul says to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word rightly dividing implies cutting the line straight and being very careful and being very precise in your use of measurement. Paul is speaking from what perspective? Remember, his occupation was a tent maker, which today will be a builder, one who builds houses. So from his occupational knowledge, he now used the word rightly dividing like a carpenter will rightly cut through woods or will rightly divide the grounds to come up with the foundation of a building. So when he mentioned to expound or to interpret, it shows that we have a duty to study. We have a duty to study. A duty to walk and see exactly what is the scriptures saying. I didn't say to be able to know. I said to be able to know precisely. To be able to know exactly what is the scripture saying. Because sometimes I have come around people and they say to me, Do you have materials for Bible interpretation? Well, you know that everything I teach is Bible interpretation. All my teachings are Bible interpretation. Every series, every subject I teach here is Bible interpretation. So, we want to look at studying scriptures. In studying scriptures, what are the things I need to do? Because remember, we are equipping you to do the work of ministry. And the apostle says, we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. So, in studying scriptures, what are the things I need to do. Bible scholars or what we call theologians, you know, they call one of these and I think is the most viable study pattern. Why study pattern? Because the Bible is a piece of literature. The Bible is not a spiritual book. The Bible is a book that contains spiritual information. So every rule of reading applies. Please pay attention. So the first style of Bible study is called the inductive style. The inductive style. Now in the inductive style, there are three principles that apply. The first is observation. If you miss observation, you can never get the interpretation right. Observation will be to ask, what is the content? Or what does it say? If you cannot read, you cannot study. You cannot interpret what you assume. You cannot interpret what you think was there. You can only interpret what is there. For example, there's no scripture that says study the Bible for yourself. Because it leads to more disaster 
Scriptures have given to us teachers to teach us. You didn't hear that. Scriptures have given to us teachers to teach us. Pay attention. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Next verse. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So scriptures have given us teachers to teach us. That is why there is no place in the scripture that says study the Bible for yourself. So we hear them just like school. We hear the teachers just like school. You now take what you were taught, then you go home and study it. Why don't school just say, buy the textbooks of chemistry, buy the textbooks of biology, read them at home and write exam and pass. Why do we have to come to classrooms and sit down? We hold our textbooks and notebooks in our hands and our teacher stands to explain what is contained in the textbooks. And even sometimes they go beyond what is in the textbooks to bring clarity to us. And after that, they ask us to ask them questions. Then after that, they ask us questions. Why is that interaction necessary? Because that is the process of transferring information or the process of teaching. Assumption is not allowed in Bible interpretation. So what we do in church is you come to church, you sit down or you attend our services online or in campuses and then the teacher teaches. You make notes. Then when you make notes, you go home like a student. You go through the notes and do your own intensive study after you have been taught. You examine what you are taught with the scriptures that you were taught. Because if God wants everybody to study for himself, then Paul will not write letters. Brother Paul will not write letters. Peter will not write letters. There will be no Bible for us. We will just say, you are not born again. The Holy Ghost is within you. Read anything God reveals to you. Read anything. No, it doesn't work like that. Your work starts after you have been taught. You didn't hear that. Your work starts after you have been taught. You have no study to study until you have been taught. It is after you have been taught that you study. That's why spiritual growth is so linked to the kind of church you attend or the kind of pastor you pay attention to. Spiritual growth is a reflection of the kind of pastor you pay attention to. And don't forget, I have also said this to you, that the kind of pastors you have, you deserve. Whoever pastors you, you deserve. Because, you know, you cannot be pastored by somebody that you don't deserve. So if you were called to give a speech, for example, maybe you were called to give a speech to the United Nations, or you were called to give a speech to World Health Organization. You can't joke. You see, because those speeches are no jokes. In fact, everybody sitting down looking at you, their faces are straight. You two, when teaching, your face is straight because your facts must be right. What do you think we're doing here? We're doing a very serious issue. If what we're doing here is more serious than United Nations and World Health. This is very serious. Sometimes... When you're about to give such speeches, you travel around to libraries to go and make research. You make research. You interface with other brilliant minds so that you have your facts together before you appear before such audiences to address them. What we're doing here is more serious than giving a speech at United Nations. You know, because the preacher of the gospel cannot compromise the place of study and cannot afford to be lazy. So the first thing about study is you come to church or you attend services where there is a seasoned teacher of the word to teach you. That's why when I teach, I give you enough to go home and study. I give you a lot of information within a little span of time because I know you're going to have a whole week or a number of days to study that material. Then sometimes you have questions. And when you have questions, it's not a bad thing. It shows that you are studying. 
But don't ask questions before you study because then you'll be sounding foolish and unlearned. First of all, study. Study the material sincerely and seriously. Study and study and study. Then when you are finished studying, if you have a question, the questions you ask after intensive study are different from the questions you ask without studying. The questions you ask without studying are foolish and unlearned. But the questions you ask after intensive study, they are very, very skilled questions. They are, they are learned questions. All right? So, the first thing is... In Bible study, number one, observation is the first principle. Number two, interpretation. Number three, application. Let's deal with observation. When you read a statement, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, who wrote it? Who wrote it? For example, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. That sounds like a positive confession. And then somebody can take that now and go around shouting, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. But the question is, who said it? Satan said it. Satan said it. So you don't just speak things and be running. You must ask questions. For example, thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established. Who said it? That statement, was it a commendation or a rebuke? Because if you study that scripture very carefully, it was a rebuke. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established. It's a rebuke. It's not a positive confession. It's like, let the weak say, I am strong. It sounds like a positive confession, but it was a mockery. It was a mockery that was, you know, spoken to the enemies of the children of Israel. So again, when you study, the questions you have to ask is, who said it? Number two, to whom was it said? Or who was it talking to? Who was it talking to? These are very simple Bible study skills. Hello, I hope you have been blessed by that wonderful message. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. For you to grow spiritually, you need to hear, study, and meditate on the word. You need to not only hear, but to also read and see. And that is why you need the Christocentric meal. This is a book that reveals to you who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. This book interprets and breaks down the word into daily meals, making it easier for you to understand and study, build up and strengthen your inner man, all the while growing your relationship with God and your confidence as a believer. To order this life-changing book and other titles, DVDs, and CDs by Dr. Abel Damina, call the number or email the address on the screen.